Business Santa here, and I want to know what some of the collective members are hoping I bring them this year. Mark from Ply Creative, what would you like Santa to bring you for Christmas? A steady stream of incoming leads. Mmm. Mel from Marsden Collective, what can Santa bring you for 2017? I would really like for our team to be embracing the new values that we've got and to be continuing to work with the amazing clients that we have. Is it more leads you need? Or would you like Santa to bring you an advanced nurture sequence and a higher conversion rate? That sounds awesome. Excellent. And when I check my lists, have you been nice to your team this year? I hope so. Why don't we ask them? Yes! <laughs> John, from Forward Planning, what would you like Santa to bring you for Christmas? Well, Santa, this year, if I could have more referrals of the perfect client, it would be what I would be after. And have you My documented man. what a perfect client is for you? I have a good way through documenting that. Yes. You document, write it down, and send it in a letter to your referral sources. Santa will be there to bring them. Josh from Steps, what would you like Santa to bring you for Christmas? I think, uh, I think the, judging by this year, Santa, that I would love another year like this year. It's been a, it's been a good year. So, can I say a repeat of this year? And when I check my list, have you been a good boy this year? Well, it depends who you are, Santa. What would you like Santa to bring you for Christmas? Well, Santa, I've been a pretty good boy, but you know, next year is probably all about scale, all about how to get that blend between boutique and taking things to the next level. And have you been a good boy with your team this year? I hope so. When I check my list, and I check it twice, have you been naughty or nice? Very nice. I believe that. <laughs> well, I'll have my hands full. But what do you want for 2017? Those plans. 
Because for most business owners, it's not a joyous experience. It does from time to time, and increasingly over the years, constantly, turn to the point where you've lost your mojo. Why is it that we lose our mojo? It's because of the overwhelm. It's because of the sheer amount of stuff that we need to be responsible for. That when you're pushed to name what you want for Christmas, what your top three priorities are, what even your number one priority is, you're immediately overwhelmed with all of the different options. I mean, right, right now, now do, do I need to be focusing on wealth? What's the valuation of my business? Am I building wealth for myself and my family? Should I be focused on growth? Is the focus at Christmas time all about how we're going to grow next year, or do I need to be thinking more about revenue? What's the short-term revenue coming in? We're we getting the workflow out the door. Should I instead be focused on the margin? Talking to suppliers, looking at our workflow processes, making sure that it's not just what we're bringing in, but it's what we're keeping. And of course, when you break those down into some of the specific things, we start to get the 100 million ideas that are going on in your head at every moment. You know, every time you go to another workshop, you get another idea. Every time you get five minutes to yourselves, you come up with more and more concepts about things that you could be doing for the business. And the risk is we start telling ourselves, these are the things I should be doing in my business. And because you're shooting all over yourself, you find yourself completely overwhelmed. And you do none of them. If I pushed you, if I forced you to name the number one thing you needed in your business, there's a good chance most of you would come up with something. I'll tell you from experience that that will normally be an operational something. You won't be strategic. It won't be thinking further ahead than the short term. And more importantly, if I asked your team to name the number one thing they need, I'd probably get a dozen different answers and you've only got a half a dozen on your team. My gift to you this Christmas is a simple framework that's designed to help overcome that million ideas that are going on in your head and to help you identify, even if it's just right now, the one thing I need to be doing. So I want you to think of your business. Think of your team, for those who have one. Think of all of the resources that make up your business. Website, uh, referral channels, uh, your office, motor vehicles, all of those resources. And I want you to abstract those into the concept of your business as an engine. All of those moving parts, all of those individuals, the resources that you've got, combine to create an engine in your business. Now that engine has a capacity. There's a certain amount of power that that engine, when all of those resources are running smoothly, are humming together, that it can create. Uh, we'll call that 100%. Now are you running at 100% power right now? I mean, it's December. The answer to that is always no, unless you're in retail. Uh, this time of year, most people are lucky to be showing up. But there is a percentage, and you can do a, a, a detailed analysis of this, uh, which I spend far too much time in spreadsheets because I love doing that. Uh, but to be honest, most business owners that I talk to have got a pretty good feel for how big their engine is and how efficiently they're actually running. When I talk to their staff, interestingly enough, team members tend to overestimate. They mistake busyness and productivity. So they will feel that they're running much closer to 100% than they are in reality. That's one of the advantages of doing the more analytical approach to measuring your engine and your utilization. So in every business, there's a gap. Which we call waste. One thing we tell you at Business Depot, waste sucks. Waste is the gap between your current utilization rate and that maximum power. Now here's a question for you. Can you run an engine at 100% power? Put your pedal to the metal, get those revs going. And you can for a brief period of time before it blows up on you. And it's exactly the same with your team, with your resources. You can have a great week or a great month and you might actually run at something close to 100%. But you will burn out the team. And there's a similar problem the other way. Uh, if you're idling, if you're, your engine's running at 10%, 20%, that's not good for the engine. It's not good for your team. That waste becomes business as usual. Bad habits creep in. Teams start to worry about whether the business is going anywhere and your best people leave. So what you want to be aiming for at any point in time is to be at a sweet spot. Not too busy, but certainly not, not busy enough either. 
Now, if your business was running at, say, 30 or 40% utilization, what would you need to do? And 99 times out of 100, what you need to do, I'll move over here to get out of the way, so that you get photographs from a different angle, is increase the power. You need to get more power out of that current engine. In other words, you need to be better. Whatever it is that the waste is there, whether that's skills, whether that's sales, whether that's uh, workflow efficiencies, the structure of your business, and there's a half a dozen different categories that fit into that. That's what you need to be doing right now. Now, once you're running at close to maximum capacity, 80, 90, 95%, you've got all that power coming in. And remember that power from your engine means money from your business. So if you're running at 95%, you've got all that power, that money coming in, and you want still more power, what do you need? In the immortal words of Jaws, we're going to need a bigger boat. You need to get a bigger engine. So that million things that are going on in your head at any point in time can be brought, brought down to one simple question. Right now, with the resources you've got, the engine that's your business, do you need to be better, get more power out of it, or do you need to be bigger, grow that engine? And it can be as simple as that sometimes for helping to create that cut through and give you focus and energy. Now, of course, once you've got the bigger engine, you need to get more power out of that. And the cycle of business, cycle of business growth, can be seen as simple as more power, bigger engine. More power, still bigger engine, more power which I find is a heck of a lot simpler than trying to work out from all of these hundred million things what it is that we need to be doing right now. I promised that there were categories. I am not going to go through them all. You'll be pleased. But as you can see, being better really breaks down into you know, getting more from the team, better structure, better operations, more sales, more revenue coming into the existing engine. And there are different ways to grow the engine. A lot of small businesses don't want more people. They think that that's one of the, the only ways that they can actually grow a bigger engine is to hire more staff. Uh, but there are different ways. If you doubled your prices, you'd have a much bigger engine. might be empty, but it'd be much bigger. <laughs> and I can, as I say, I can dig into the spreadsheets. We can have a whole lot of fun talking about uh, you know, the theory of constraints and uh, time and motion analyses and all of these kind of things. And to be honest, once you get over about 30 or 40 staff, some of that is really, really critical. But most business owners I know have a really good feel for where their engine currently is. And then the conversation turns to how big do we want to get it. So if you have an idea of your engine now, then the, the subsequent question is, well, where do you want to take it? How big an engine do you want to create? What's your vision? And once we've got those two things clear, measurable, then we can start to build that roadmap as to how. Now where how? Power up that engine, get a bigger engine. More power, bigger engine. More power, bigger engine. Simple steps. Simple steps that you can communicate with your team. And of course, which Claire touched on uh, in quite a little bit of detail, so I'm not going to, all of this is powered by your why. What's the purpose for your business internally and externally? Because that's going to guide the size of your vision and the process you need to get there. Simple checklist. Measure your engine today, agree how big you want to grow, and then plan the strategic steps. Now, part of that is a question about how you want to feel as you grow. Do you want to max that power out in that engine, get to 85 90%? That's maximum profitability. Everybody's busy. Everybody's working hard. The money's coming in. And then just a slightly bigger engine, incremental growth. Is that the feeling that you want to experience, or do you want much faster growth? Maybe we just want to get it to... 40 or 50% power, that's pretty easy. There's a whole lot of waste there that we don't even need to handle, and then we're going to double the size of the engine. We're going to double the size of that engine every six months. We're probably not going to make money for the next two or three years, but the next thing you know, we're going to be one tell. Maybe a better example could have been handled. <laughs> and my experience is that you get three types of business owners uh, when you do this exercise. Uh, and the most common is, is these guys, the intuitive business owners, the ones who really just want to do a gut feel analysis. And keep coming back to, they're normally pretty accurate. Don't feel that your gut is not something to be listened to because you're normally pretty spot on. Uh, and when I ask them about the business today, you know, it's, it's that 
gut feel, that instinct. Uh, you know, it feels like this. Where I know we're not profitable enough. Uh, where do you want to get to? Ah, oh, I reckon, you know, million dollar profit sounds like uh, that'd be a good thing to tell my EO team that I've managed to achieve. At that point, I'm probably going to sell it. Uh, I just want it to feel easy. And if I push them on, okay, well, what are the specific steps? They'll come up, normally two or three out, maybe four or five. Uh, and just because they're a gut feel doesn't mean they're the wrong steps. Often they're, they're pretty accurate. Okay, well, let's get some sales going. We need better sales because that's going to fill up you know, maximize the power out of this engine. Once we've got that going, we're going to recruit. We're going to recruit better people. So that's how we're going to get a bigger engine. Now we've got better people, so culture is going to be a priority. How do we get the culture? Because that's going to build a lot of efficiencies, get rid of waste, power up that next size engine. And that's the point at which I've got this great idea for a new product that we're going to launch out into the market, and that's going to really take the world by storm. So that's going to be the bigger engine. And at that point, we're going to be making bucket loads of money, so I need some better analytics because I'm ready to sell. The challenge with being the intuitive entrepreneur is that if I ask you that question next week, are you going to come up with the same answer? And if you come in and tell your team that this is our strategic roadmap for 2017 or for the next three years, five years, and then two weeks later you come in and tell them something different, then you go to a, a great workshop and some guy says, think about engines, and then it's something different again, the team are going to stop listening. One of the risks of being intuitive is you need to make sure that that communication is extra strong. Second type of business owner is more of a feeling space. That doesn't mean that they react emotionally. It just means they make decisions, they process their decisions uh, through the feelings a, a lot more. So they're going to give me similar information uh, and similar vision, but maybe a little bit more linked to house and family. And they'll probably come up with, if this is the right strategic roadmap, they'll come up with the same path to that growth. It's the third type that I find really fun because I'm sad. I'm the sort of guy who dresses up as Santa Claus and comes and talks about capacity planning. When I ask them about the engine today, they've got the numbers. 14 staff are at 55% utilisation rate. Our EBIT's down 20% from last year. We need to ramp this up. The vision, again, similarly detailed, analytical. Uh, here's where the real difference comes in, though, is the strategic path because they're thinking about the engine size along the way. So unlike the gut field business owner who says we need sales. The thinking business owner is saying we need sales and that's going to get us from 55% to 75%. And at 75% we're going to recruit more people and that's going to drop us back to 60. And then I'm going to focus culture and we're going to get us to 80%. That's what this means in terms of dollars and cents because that's going to fund the launch of that new product. And that new product's going to double the size of our business overnight. We're going to go from 80% in that engine to 40% in an engine that's twice as big. And from there, we're going to sell the heck out of that new product and we're going to start getting the analytics. The benefit of this approach is that it's much easier to communicate and hold the team objectively accountable to these kind of measurements. Because if the intuitive business owner says we need sales training and then in three months, six weeks, six months says, okay, we've done enough sales training, nobody's going to disagree. But when the analytical business owner or the business advisor who's helping them says, okay, the target is 75%. We've communicated with the team, with the sales manager. We know exactly what that target is. And that target tells us when that strategy has or hasn't been successful. So mapping that out means the team can take a lot more ownership. Because the problem with abstracting everything into a concept of engines is that we are missing something. We're missing the fact that your business is people, is team, is all of those individual resources with their own needs and drive and agenda. And if we don't communicate our strategy with the team, then they're much less likely to actually understand or implement what we want to do. What I encourage business owners to do, particularly when they're feeling like this, is to get the team involved. This is a great time of year, heading into Christmas or January, again, depending on the industry. It can be a great time of year to take a breath, to pull the team together when you're less busy, and to actually take the time to map out your strategy. Maybe it's just navigating... 2017. Maybe you are looking further afford. You've got 2020 vision, uh, which is a three-year plan. Uh, maybe uh, you're, you're swinging for the fences. You've got really, really big goals that you want to share with everyone. Maybe you realize that the business, either because it's in startup or because it's completely stuck, needs to be unpicked. You need to go right the way back to basics and redo the whole business by design. Whichever of those it is, get the team involved in the design process. Because if they're involved in the design of the strategy, then they will own the implementation. 
If you're a pigeon owner, you know, flies in, poops everywhere, flies back out again, comes in and says, here's the strategy, here's what we're doing this year, the team are going to start resisting it. Now, resistance isn't a bad thing, it means they're engaging with it, but you could do it better if you involve them up front. Because if you give them the tools, give them the power, then with your team, your resources, your engine throbbing behind you, you will be able to raise the bar in 2017. And the opportunity there is that you've set out that whole path for what you're going to achieve next year. You achieve it. And when Business Santa shows up next December, Christmas 2017, you've got that strategic roadmap there. It says, this is exactly what we're doing, so this is what I want. Or, because you've had such an incredible year, you just get to ask for more of the same. So what are business centres takeaways? <laughs> What's your capacity today? Can you measure it? What's your utilisation rate? Can you communicate that with the team? Your number one priority, do you need to be bigger or be better? And answer truthfully, because I'm watching. <laughs> Once you're clear, ask yourself, where do I want to go? If I had a magical sleigh that could take me anywhere, where would it take me? And how do I want that journey to feel? And then sit down with yourself, your partner, your fellow directors of your entire team, and think, what's the roadmap we need strategically? This year, the next few years, back to basics or beyond. sounds a little bit like on culture, on products, on training, then pricing. <laughs> go sales, go channels, more people, that's icy. <laughs> can stand on your sleigh with a plan all can see, saying, here's where I'm going, who's coming with me? <laughs> then let me explain before I go out of sight. Merry Christmas to all. And to all, a bigger, better 2017. Thank you, Jacob. <laughs>